Maybe let's start now with um, our second meeting. We have been discussing at the beginning of this meeting to maybe rename it since we are still very young in our efforts. Um, and to instead of conversations between sociologists, continue with this um, Serbian Polish or Belgrade Warsaw seminars uh, entitled Sociology Talks. That was one of the idea before in order to broaden the scope of uh, both topics, but primarily people who may not be sociologists by trainings, but who are uh, sociologically minded, let's say that way. Uh, so, um, Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory and the Faculty of uh, Sociology University of Warsaw are jointly uh, organizing these uh, seminar sessions, uh, organized by Barbara posak herbst and me. Uh, and today we are going to uh, talk about the discourse of neoliberalism as a form of power. Lacan's theory of social bond and neoliberal governmentality. And uh, our to get today's discussants uh, are going to be Krzysztof Szwirek and Milan Urošević. Um, I will just briefly introduce them uh, and I will not introduce what they're going to talk about. Uh, it's going to be very interesting, I can say uh, all, all already now, uh, but it, the interesting thing is how uh, these two topics and talks are going to be interrelated as if really that they were written or conceived in some kind of um, joint space. So uh, Krzysztof Świerek is a um, sociologist, assistant professor at the Faculty of Sociology at the University of Warsaw, where uh, he defended his PhD thesis in 2016. His scientific interests include theories of ideology, symbolic power, and social classes. He lectures on classical sociological theories and has conducted seminars on conceptions of modernity and psychoanalytical analysis of power, which is being reflected in his book uh, published in 2018, uh, theories of ideology at the junction of Marxism and psychoanalysis. I wanted to read it in Polish, but then uh, with the junction, I had such a problem that I decided it's better to stick to the English translation. Um, he published articles in numerous uh, uh, Polish, but also European uh, journals. And he's a member of the editorial team of academic journal VIEW. Uh, theories and Practices of Visual Culture, and also the research in Repast Project, and Principal Investigator in a project funded from Miniatura Program of the Polish National Science Center. Among other things, he also publishes essays and reviews on cinema and Polish press. Um, so, and today he is going to talk um, about the, the link between Lacan, governmentality, that is Foucault in a way, and neoliberalism, while Milan Urošević is a research trainee at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory at the University of Belgrade. He got his bachelor and master degrees at the Department of Sociology at the Faculty of Philosophy in Belgrade, and his interest includes cultural studies, theories of ideology, theories of subjectivity, post-structuralist philosophy, I would add postmodernist as well, uh, semiotics and discourse analysis. He has published in journals like Sociologia, Sociologi Pregled, Kultura, and Ethnoanthropologi Problemi. He was one of the organizers of the conference Horizons of Engagement, Eternalizing Pierre Bouteau, but you who that took place uh, in December 2020 at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Um, we have uh, made a little plan that Milan will start. So Milan has 30 minutes, then Krzysztof uh, will take over with uh, 30 minutes of his talk, and then we will have discussion guided by Barbara and me. Milan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I will now share my screen so you can see my presentation. So, as Adriana said, uh, this is the topic of my presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us to listen to our seminar. 
uh, my uh, the topic of my presentation will be postmodern culture and how it relates to subjectivity from the perspective of uh, uh, the, uh, Foucault's theory of governmentality. Now I will start with some basic to uh, outline some basic notions I will be using in this in this presentation. I will try not to dwell a lot on it since theories of uh, governmentality are not the main topic basically. So when it comes uh, to Foucault we can say that his work encompasses three types of practices or uh, as he might say three uh, dimensions of practice itself. Those three types of practices are discursive practice which is a practice that deals with creation of meaning in uh, different ways uh, like speech and textual creation. The second type uh, is the non-discursive practices. These practices deal with uh, uh, spatial and uh, temporal arrangements, uh, the um, arrangements of bodily movements and things like that within certain institutions. And the third type of practice, uh, which Foucault um, introduces in the third uh, period of his work in the 80s is subjectivity, which is uh, the subject's relation to himself and uh, to uh, and um, a dimension through which the subject uh, governs himself or herself. Now, uh, governmentality or the practice of government, we can say, is a broad type of practice which deals with how uh, cert how these practices are arranged within certain institutions and the um, relations between these institutions in a certain society, in a certain uh, historical period. Basically, this theory is a kind of an extrapolation, uh, which uh, Foucault does, of his work in uh, discipline and punish, but on a broader societal level, um, uh, therefore um, answering to some of his uh, critiques uh, and some criticisms that were um, aimed at him after the publishing of that book. Now, um, uh, as I've said, uh, this kind of uh, uh, practice, the practice of uh, uh, governmentality, as Derrida also said, uh, uh, doesn't have a center, meaning there is no central instance, central institution, which uh, governs uh, practices in a certain society, but is a kind of uh, decentralized uh, heterogeneous practice that is uh, united through uh, common governmental rationality. This governmental rationality is a kind of a way of reasoning about how practices should be governed, how in institution, institutions uh, should be arranged and the um, relations between those institutions. Um, and it is what, uh, what uh, um, uh, it is a kind of a, we can say a creation of rules about how practices should be uh, governed, how institutions uh, should be arranged, and it is what um, function it functions like um, a united system which uh, uh, governs various institutions within a certain society and the um, relations between those institutions. And when you have a certain governmental um, rationality. Uh, within a certain uh, society in a certain historical period which organizes those institutions and their interrelations, inter you have what Foucault calls a certain governmental regime. Now, uh, the way that the, an individual is uh, incorporated within a certain governmental um, regime, Foucault calls subjection. It is basically the same thing as interpolation in Altisur and um, it is a process by which a certain individual is included within a certain position in a uh, governmental um, regime that uh, therefore uh, organizes his practices in accordance with the rules of a governmental um, rationality. Now, I will introduce some notions that maybe um, that are not uh, always found easily in Foucault like uh, the notion of the ethos. It is uh, developed by Foucault in uh, the series of lectures uh, on the uh, hermeneutics of the subject and was later used by Nicholas Rose and Peter Miller, uh, prominent uh, uh, theorists of governmentality. 
uh, ethos will be in my inter interpretation will be we can view it as an aspect of a uh, governmental um, regime that encompasses the rules that subject the individual and the rules that organize the individual's subjectivity in a kind of a unified uh, system which therefore uh, subjects the individual uh, through his subjectivity making the individual govern himself or herself in a certain way thereby subjecting them thereby them uh, uh, governing uh, themselves in accordance with a certain governmental rationality now how does the individual do that uh, i will um, use the notion of the big other to explain that uh, of course it is a notion that comes from lacan it was used by altesseur but it has a longer history than that some authors say that uh, lacan uh, is inspired by hegel's idea of the uh, um, master and the slave, so the master is the big other that gives uh, subjectivity and self-consciousness to the slave. The big other, in my interpretation, can be viewed as a virtual figure, meaning that it doesn't actually, quote-unquote, exist, but it exists through its effects. It is a figure constructed by the rules of the ethos to make um, the uh, those rules meaningful and illegitimate, meaning that uh, that is the way that the big other uh, um, makes meaningful the rules to which an individual organizes his subjectivity and governs himself. Now I will go on to talk a little about the economic uh, changes in the 20th century, since uh, they are a context which gives rise to postmodern culture. So the beginning of the 20th century, the first half is characterized by what is usually called the Fordist organization of production or Fordism. It is characterized by a strong uh, government um, control of the economy. Uh, the uh, government uh, guarantees full employment, health benefits, uh, social benefits, education, etc. And the investments uh, during this organization of productions aim at production, aim at profits in the long term meaning that which uh, means that uh, production is what you would call mass production uh, mass production of uh, similar products uh, companies uh, so we we can say that fordism is uh, characterized by stability in a way now companies uh, in the period of fordism are organized as senate says like a pyramid meaning that they have a hierarchical, um, a rigid hierarchical structure through which an individual employee progresses uh, during his, uh, the, the time of his employment in his lifetime. Uh, those rules, uh, that uh, structure uh, and the way that the individual is subjected to it uh, are very similar to what Foucault calls the disciplinary regime. Uh, which he uh, thoroughly describes in the lectures Security, Territory and Population and gives us a brief insight to it uh, in uh, Discipline and Punish, but on in using the prison as a, an example. As you remember, the prison is organized for him and other institutions, you know, like the schools, he says, and hospitals, like a panopticon, meaning that you have a singular instance at the top, you have what he calls the eye of power, and it observes prisoners. It produces the norms to which those prisoners are subjected. And in one of his papers, uh, where he compares Foucault and Lacan, Laden Dular says that the eye of power at the top of the panopticon is precisely the same thing as the big other in Lacan. Uh, meaning that uh, if we apply that to Fordist companies, we can say that uh, in them, the exactly the, that structure, the uh, of a pyramid and its bureaucratic organization is the big other that produces the norms that then subject individual employees as subjects to it. And as one author says, when he uh, was um, explaining the organization of Fordist companies in them, the employees subjected to quote unquote transcendent importance of the company. So in the ethos of discipline, which uh, is the way that those companies uh, govern subjects. The big other is outside of the subject. It's somewhere out there and it produces the norms to which I as a subject am subjected to. 
Now, I mean, it, uh, we all know the uh, oil crisis of 1973 and all of that gives rise to neoliberal um, organization of the economy, which is also sometimes called post-Fordism or as David Harvey calls it, flexible accumulation. Now, unlike Fordism, post-Fordism is characterized by constant change, constant innovation. Uh, it is characterized by not by mass production, but by differential production for different segments of the market, production of specific products, uh, which is also um, um, which is also uh, enabled by modern uh, modern uh, technology and also called uh, just in time production. Um, also, the labor market is changed, so um, it um, it uh, gives rise to flexible employment, um, uh, flexible work contracts, temporary contracts, and all of that. So, in order to accommodate uh, uh, themselves to it, uh, companies also reorganize themselves. And unlike the pyramid in the period of Fordism, we now have what is called the network organization. So companies, because the demands of the market are constantly changing and fluctuating, uh, they're now organized like an, a network, meaning that they can, um, uh, they can change and accommodate uh, themselves to these requirements. They can uh, they can um, hire someone uh, temporarily and all of that. And um, as a Senate also mentioned, the ideal employee in these companies is now someone who can constantly recreate uh, himself. He can acquire new skills. He can uh, adapt to new uh, job requirements, etc. And of course, the ethos which governs subject in these companies also has to change. So, uh, as we can see in like the writings of Boltanski and Chappelle in the New Spirit of Capitalism, uh, workers, employees are now motivated to work in a different way by presenting them uh, the work for the company as a way to realize themselves, to fulfill their dreams, desires, find the, uh, their true self um, and uh, self-actualize, etc. So as we can see, this ethos is now different. Unlike in the Fordist companies, the big other is now, we can say that it is it uh, goes to the internal uh, dimension of the subject. Now the subject's own dreams and desires are, uh, are uh, the big other because it's what motivates them, it is what subjects the, uh, the employee to the company and by striving for their own happiness the employees now actually uh, are uh, governed uh, in accordance with the new ethos so it is really similar to what Foucault notes in the birth of biopolitics when he analyzes the neoliberal governmental um, regime he says that now the um, the uh, individual's subjectivity is the aim of government. The individual is made to uh, govern himself in a certain way and to experience that as freedom. Uh, and by doing, uh, by governing himself in that way, he's actually being uh, governed in accordance with the new governmental rationality of neoliberalism. Uh, now, when it comes to culture, uh, governmentality theories don't talk a lot about culture, so I will not dwell a lot on the like, definitions and all of that. Following someone like John Fisk, we can say that culture deals with pleasure, meaning, and uh, identity, and we can see it as a kind of a dimension of a certain governmental regime. Now, in the period of the Fordist mode of um, regulation, since, as I mentioned, Fordism creates uh, a lot of similar products, so a mass production of similar products. And as Lipovetsky also noted, Fordism is characterized by the logic of quantity, which means that companies try to get consumers to consume as much as they can of very similar products. Now, the culture that is produced by this is what you would, um, as you would note, is what is uh, what was uh, called mass culture, which is now uh, a term uh, um, largely abandoned. Uh, it is a, a kind of a uniform, monotonous, uh, conformist culture and was best uh, analyzed by Adorno and Horkheimer. 
who called it the culture industry and uh, described it like a, a giant machine which produces many different cultural products on the basis of the same kind of pattern or matrix. And now we can even say on the basis of the same algorithm in a way. And you can see how this cultural arrangement mimics the ethos of discipline in a way. In the 60s, this, this culture was criticized by what we now call counterculture, you know, hippies, minorities and all of that. And this was uh, uh, what also Boltanski and Chappelle call artistic critique. So it was a kind of criticism which was criticizing this conformism, alienation and monotony and was appropriated, as they also note, by uh, certain institutions. Now, when it comes to post uh, post we can see how this was appropriated. Since companies now produce specialized products for specialized segments of the market, they are marketing these products in a different way. They are marketing them uh, as products to which you create your own lifestyle, your identity, express your true self, etc. And um, uh, this is where um, the notion of authenticity in postmodern culture becomes very important, as someone like uh, Christopher Lash or Bauman also note, and uh, also Todd McGowan, a Lacanian cultural theorist. Um, he was analyzing uh, uh, and uh, comparing different kinds of superegos in different cultural periods. And unlike previously, when let's, uh, let's say Sigmund Freud was writing, uh, he says that um, at that time, uh, as you remember, he says that um, a lot of his patients are what he calls uh, neurotics. They are um, incapable of uh, allowing themselves to enjoy, have orgasms, etc. Uh, Todd McGowan says that unlike at that time in the in the in postmodern culture, a new superego is created, which um, which creates an imperative for the individual to enjoy, a duty to enjoy. So uh, an incitement of enjoyment and um, looking for your own true desires and realizing them. So this is. Uh, as you can see, uh, also mimics the ethos of neoliberalism in neoliberal uh, governmental regime. Now, uh, I will move on to next part, uh, which uh, deals with the internal mechanisms of postmodern subjectivity. But in order to present that, I will have to present these four, I will call them categories of subjectivity. They are like four elements, four kinds of or, um, rules which uh, govern and organize individual subjectivity and they are my redefinitions of uh, four, uh, four categories of ethics that Foucault talks about in the beginning of the second volume of History of Sexuality. As you may know, uh, for Foucault, ethics deals with uh, the way that the individual relates to himself, so it is synonymous with subjectivity. Uh, now, um, the first category is ethical substance. It uh, is a category that um, uh, that uh, deals with the object of individual's uh, government of himself, meaning something within his subjectivity, which he tries to uh, govern, there, uh, therefore governing himself or herself. The second category is the mode of subjection. It deals with the individual's um, relation to the big other and the norms that the big other prescribes in order for the individual uh, to form this relation to his ethical substance. The third category is ethical work. Uh, it deals with uh, concrete practices which individual employs in order to govern his ethical substance in accordance with the big other's norms. And the last uh, category is the telos, the goal. It is a vision that the individual has uh, that he um, uh, strives for while uh, governing himself and forming his subjectivity, his relation to himself. When it comes to postmodern subjectivity, the ethical substance is uh, what I have uh, mentioned so far a few times is desire. And as we can see, uh, this ethical substance, this desire, is very similar to how Lacan understands desire. And uh, it is uh, a desire as a lack, meaning that the individual perceives a certain lack within himself and 
has a desire to fulfill that lack. So uh, this uh, gives rise to what Lacan calls the ideal ego. The ideal ego is a vision an individual has of himself, uh, uh, himself without the lack with his desire realized. And now the mode of subjection, as you can probably guess, is the, uh, the finding of this desire of this lack and fulfilling it. Now, when it comes to ethical work is maybe when things get a little more interesting. Uh, now, the ethical work uh, for, the, uh, for the subject in postmodern culture is this constant self-reflection and constant looking for his own true and authentic uh, desires. As uh, Lipovetsky, who I have uh, mentioned once so far, notes when he talks about the self in uh, the period of postmodernity, he says that the individual is here guided towards constantly self-reflecting and constantly searching, searching for his own true self. Now, the problem with that is that, as he says, the, uh, the individual subjectivity in postmodernity is like an empty mirror, quote unquote. This means that uh, because the individual is constantly looking, um, looking for his true self, his own self is constantly changing. So this process is never ending. And the uh, the in the it's like a loop that is constantly being uh, being uh, it's constantly turning. Now, at the same uh, in a, in a similar way, Lacan claims that the uh, desire is metonymic. Me, what that means is that when an individual fulfills his desire, when he um, realizes his lack. Uh, when he feels the lack, the lack just moves to a different place and you have a new desire. So this ethical work is actually never ending because we are constantly, we are guided towards constantly searching for our true self and our true desires. Uh, now, as you can also probably guess, this uh, ideal ego that I mentioned is the telos of the individual subject. The a role of this uh, of this category of subjectivity, we can maybe call it, is a mechanism of interpolation. What the, that means is that this vision of the individual with his true desires realized in himself, being self-actualized, self-fulfilled, etc., is what uh, is actually um, uh, is what is actually uh, a mechanism of subjection. Uh, this vision is what. Uh, includes the in individual that interpolates it into the neoliberal governmental um, regime and which uh, uh, guides him towards organizing his own subjectivity in this way. Uh, this is what some authors like Bauman and Baudrillard call seduction. Or well, what seduction means is a kind of a mechanism of interpolation, a mechanism of subjection, because unlike in previous uh, historical periods, uh, the individual's uh, interpolation isn't being done by appealing to uh, duty, faith, loyalty, but uh, by appealing to his own uh, desires. So, as Bauman says, the individual is uh, experiencing his interpolation in this governmental um, regime as himself striving to realize his own uh, desires, which is precisely what makes it, what makes this uh, governmental um, regime powerful and um, and uh, kind of uh, cunning, you can say maybe. And now uh, I will end my presentation with this quote that I found in a recent article, uh, which deals with Lacan's um, discourse uh, of capitalism, the fifth uh, discourse, which we will about these uh, discourse, uh, discourses, we will hear more from uh, from Christoph. Uh, this is a quote I won't read it to you. you. You can read it. It's boring for me to read it. Uh, but um, I think it uh, uh, describes the interpolation, the subjection into the neoliberal governmental um, um, regime very well. So uh, that's it from, from me. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thanks. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be able to share with you uh, my thoughts on the subject and 
it plays really well that uh, Milan's presentation was the first one because uh, Milan really uh, well introduced us to to the problem of neoliberalism, and uh, I will try to um, I will try to uh, um, develop more the theory of uh, discourses in in Lacanian uh, work. And the topic of my presentation is, is the discourse of neoliberalism as a form of power in Lacan's theory of social bond and in neoliberal governmentality. So I will try to combine um, also the theoretical framework of Lacan with the notion of governmentality of Michel Foucault, uh, the notion only and not the whole theory. I will, I will talk about this uh, uh, in, a, in a minute. Uh, uh, well, mm, this is a part of my ongoing research on potential uses of uh, Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis in sociology, especially to describe contemporary neoliberal society. And part of this argument that I will present to you uh, today appeared already in, in uh, my, um, my article, Governmentality Beyond the Master's Function. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it is in Polish, so it's it's available only only to to some some of you. But uh, you can find abstract online. I talk about this. Um, the uh, theory of discourses uh, was developed by Lacan uh, during his seminar of 1969 uh, to 1970. Uh, it appeared uh, as a book called "The Other Side of Psychoanalysis." That's the that's the English title. Uh, the French title, L'Envers de la Psychanalyse, uh, which means psychoanalysis inside out, or uh, it is some, sometimes translated as psychoanalysis upside down. Uh, and um, Lacan um, speaks here about this uh, relationship of psychoanalysis to other form of social bonds, or he tries to develop the psychoanalysis and different form of discourses in contemporary society. Uh, and he uh, posits there this very important uh, idea that psychoanalysis is the exact opposite of the discourse of power, of the discourse of the master. So uh, the, the whole context of seminars, uh, the basic context is that uh, Lacan conducted those seminars uh, to train analysts, uh, right, to, to transmit psychoanalysis as a, uh, some sort of discourse and some sort of practice. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, he was not trying to develop um, general social theory. He was very uh, far from this uh, idea of developing his own theory of society. And he was very critical uh, of university discourse uh, of those endeavors that uh, tried to put, um, put some sort of knowledge in the uh, in, in, in the form of uh, some set of uh, theoretical notions that you can mix about, that you can use uh, any way you want. So he tried to develop something uh, completely different. And uh, if somebody wants to use this theory of, uh, of Lacan's to uh, interpret society or to understand society, uh, one has to be careful and understand that it was developed in different contexts, right? Not as a social theory in general, but as a uh, as a theory of psychoanalysis proper. Uh, and uh, social context of this uh, particular seminar, the other side of and uh, Lacan's sexism uh, towards the revolt of 1968 and 1969, as expressed in his famous words that Lacan um, that Lacan. Uh, uttered in, in a discussion, very heated discussion with, uh, with radical students. Uh, and he um, famously said to them, what you aspire to as revolutionaries is a master and you shall have one. So uh, this was, um, uh, this, this famous quote was, uh, uh, this was spoken by Lacan uh, in 1969. And uh, the, the obvious question here is, who is the new master then? Who is the new master that those radical students aspire to? So um, this course, uh, um, 
some basics of Lacan's theory of discourses I, I would like to introduce you to. Uh, it's of course very difficult because it's, uh, uh, it's extremely complex and as some of you probably know, Lacan is not very, uh, it's not very easy to um, interpret Lacan or it's not very easy to, uh, to introduce his concept, uh, concepts in, in such a way of, of, some, of some short talk, but I will do my best. Um, Lacan's theory of discourses uh, is, is very specific as uh, discourse is for Lacan not a text in a context or series or, or sequences of utterance, utterances. Uh, discourse basically is a configuration of relations and a form of social bond. So uh, uh, discourse always des uh, describes some sort of uh, situation and relation between people uh, and uh, Lacan used in his seminar a formalized descrip description of discourses. Uh, Lacan uses this formal notation that I will, uh, I will show you in a minute uh, to extract knowledge from different configuration of the four basic terms used in this notation. And uh, by, uh, by uh, manipulating those terms in, in different places of, of those diagrams of the four discourses, you get four diagrams for every uh, discourse. And uh, those are the discourse, uh, discourse of university, discourse of the master, the hysterics discourse and uh, discourse of the analyst. That are the four basic relations for types of social bond that Lacan's is, uh, Lacan is uh, interpreting in his seminar. And I will relate to two of those, uh, of those discourses to the discourse of the master and uh, discourse of the university. So cru uh, crucial for understanding the notation of Lacan uh, are, uh, is the relationship between four places of the diagram and four terms that Lacan uses. And the formal description of the discourse is always achieved by moving the elements to different places. So diagrams are not illustrations, simply illustrations to, to show something that is developed in another way. But uh, those diagrams are a tool for different uh, for uh, further study. So basically, if you construct those diagrams, it's not to just to illustrate some notions that you already have but you put some notions in relation to um, be able to um, put some more theoretical work to develop it more and so on and so on. So we have four places of the discourse. Uh, we have agent on uh, upper left side. Uh, agent is a person who acts. Uh, the place uh, called work, um, which is uh, on the... Um, upper row right hand side uh, and work is what is prescribed by the agent right so agent commands um, commands and puts uh, puts something to work right this can be other person or an object or, or something else the truth of the discourse it's the lower part uh, right uh, left hand side the truth is the is the dimension of the driving force behind the relation, which is hidden or repressed. So if we have an agent, he is acting on behalf of some repressed or uh, hidden truth that is, uh, that is described by the notion that is put on the, uh, on the bottom side uh, of the left-hand side of the diagram. And um, the production, the uh, lower side of the right-hand diagram is the leftover of the relation, something that couldn't be assimilated in a way. So it's not a production in the um, obvious meaning of something that comes out of the relation or, some, uh, or what is, what is uh, achieved by the social bond, but something that acts as a leftover and couldn't be assimilated in the process. So formal description of, uh, of a discourse is achieved by way of putting elements in the four places of the diagram. Those four elements are, are here on, on my slide. And those uh, four terms that are arranged in any discursive relation, according to Lacan, uh, is uh, 
the master signifier it's um, it's written um, um, s and uh, by the letter s and uh, index uh, one is the master signifier is the commanding word it's the word in power so to speak uh, s uh, index two is the battery of signifiers um, also called by Lacan knowledge. Um, every battery of signifiers that are put in some orders uh, can achieve this formal, uh, uh, this formal construction of a knowledge of something, of some, uh, some battery of utterances, some battery of, of signifiers that, that describe something or signify something. Um, the, um, the object cause of desire is the, it's the little a. Um, it's the, mm, uh, one of the most developed and one of the most difficult um, terms in Lacanian theory. Uh, and some, some of you, uh, I think, know the mm, works of Slavoj Žižek or had some contact with, uh, with his works. And Slavoj Žižek describes this uh, um, little a object uh, very, very well. Uh, and this, to simplify things, uh, the object cause of desire is not the object that the uh, agent or the subject strives towards. It's not something that we put as the aim of our actions, but is the object that causes the actions of the agents. It's an object that is behind the, uh, the desire of the subject. It animates the desire, it makes it appear, and not is, uh, it is not an object of desire, but object cause of desire. So it's something behind the relationship of desire. And the last uh, very important notion is the bird subject. It's the, uh, the uh, S, the S that is that is crossed by by a bar. Uh, the bar, bird subject is a uh, subject that is uh, that is um, appearing in language and is always already barred by language and its rules. So basically, uh, as individuals, we have also this subjective dim dimension and subjectivity for Lacan is something very strictly related to signifiers and how we um, operate signifiers and how signifiers represent us uh, in, in uh, any relation. So the subject is something that appears through language and always in the confines of the language. So those terms modify their function in any diagram and relation in the four discourses. So we have four discourses, the master's discourse, university, hysteric, and analytic discourse. And unfortunately, uh, the meaning of those four terms that I, that I spoke about is slightly different in any type of discourse because when those uh, elements are written in different places of the diagram, they modify their meaning. So uh, it's a very um, complex theoretical tool. So, the first discourse that I, will, I would like to talk about is the master's discourse. Uh, and it's a formalized description of a social, social band, this type of social band that is found in the traditional relations of power. So uh, in every type of power known in history, uh, we have this basic form of social relation or social bond. And Lacan, uh, as, as Milan, uh, Milan already said, um, in the case of Big Other, but uh, for sure Lacan developed this uh, master's discourse in close relationship with Hegel's phenomenology of spirit and the fragments about uh, the dialectics of master and slave. But uh, Lacan modified it a bit, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the basic relationship is taken from this uh, great book by Hegel. So uh, in the case of the master's discourse, we have uh, the S1 master signifier as the agent. Um, and uh, the agent is, uh, uh, is, is uh, uttering a commandment 
towards the slave, towards the object, towards the other, to uh, put him to work and to produce knowledge, the S2, so that the knowledge can uh, rationalize the demands of power. So uh, we have here this, this basic relationship uh, um, in which um, we can describe how people are governed. There is a master signifier, which is a commanding word of the master, the expression of his will, that becomes a command to be obeyed by others, by the by people subjected to power, and there is uh, a knowledge as to produced to rationalize this demand. But this rationalization comes always afterwards. So the basic impulse comes from the master, so to speak, to put people to work and to, uh, for them to product produce knowledge. Uh, so, in traditional relations of power, there is a man in charge who commands other to work, and the expression of his will is the rule of power. Therefore, in those traditional relations, uh, uh, power has a name. Uh, both in secular and, and religious domain, everything is done, is done in the name of somebody, king of, or, or uh, religious leader. And this is a master in any given domain. So this figure of a master is uh, crucial for social relations to appear as they are, because you need this uh, figure to be able to, uh, to organize some social relations. Decisions of power have a clear source, the will of those who are in command. And people subjected to power can follow it or oppose it, but uh, they certainly know who is in charge and who is to blame. So uh, you can be uh, either very enthusiastic about power or you can be uh, in, in very um, deep opposition towards power, but, but you certainly know who is uh, making those decisions and who is to blame for, for them. And what is important here, the master is not a person, but a function. So master's personal traits are irrelevant. Uh, he can be basically uh, very wise or he can be very stupid, he can be very powerful one, or, can, uh, or he can be very weak as an individual. What is important is his role as a, uh, as a function in a social bond and not a, a, as an uh, empirical individual. Master can be ignorant, for instance, uh, but uh, he is a master and his words hold. Uh, and when Lacan spoke of master, he, he spoke about him in, in, uh, in a very specific way that the master doesn't want uh, to know anything about the world. He only wants things to, um, to operate. He only uh, wants things to work, right? He only wants things to go further. So he's not interested in the mechanics of the of how things are done, he only wants the things done in a way in, in which he sees fit. So uh, this is the, the analysis, uh, the master's discourse is the analysis of, of, uh, of uh, relation of governing people. And uh, another uh, discourse that I will, uh, I will refer to is the university discourse. And uh, this discourse describes the relation of teaching. Uh, and in this, uh, and this, uh, in this kind of discourse, we have knowledge in the place of agent. So the knowledge takes the place of the master in university discourse. Uh, you have this work of uh, being an object. It's important that here the the object, uh, uh, this little a object, uh, plays uh, a different role in in. Uh, very specific role uh, because uh, Lacan um, spoke about uh, students, so those who are subjected to this relationship of teaching. Uh, he spoke so about students as those little a objects. So basically, they they are they are put in the place of uh, of work as those little objects, uh, causes of desire. 
In this discourse, uh, we see knowledge, the battery of signifiers in the place of the agent. So the knowledge is in charge, not the, not the figure of the master is important here, but the battery of signifiers. The knowledge is operating. So knowledge means here every discourse that is put in formal order as a set of signifiers. So basically it can be any type of knowledge, economic knowledge, for instance, but also social uh, science or any type of uh, theoretical discourse or, or, um, or a set of propositions about the world that you can put in this, in this place of, of the master put in charge. So when knowledge is in power, it governs as a neutral prescription of impersonal rule. So the prescription or command defining what is to be done is more important than who produces the discourse. So basically, uh, if you have knowledge, you have a discourse that is without, uh, without the subject, so to speak. Uh, the subject is absent from it because the knowledge appears as something impersonal and objective. So it's a very specific type of relationship, very specific type of social bond, and we will see in a, in a minute uh, how it relates to, uh, towards neoliberal governmentality. So um, in, in my article, uh, that I spoke about earlier in, uh, from 2019, um, I, I took this notion of governmentality uh, to show that neoliberalism as a discourse of power is something that places itself beyond the master's function, something outside this traditional relationship of power. So I treat, basically I treat neoliberalism as a discourse of power as an assemblage of theories, practices, forms of interaction, institutional designs. Uh, and so this is certainly something more than one theory of political uh, economy among the others. So it's basically, I'm not interested in, in, in the specific neoliberal discourse in economy, but I treat neoliberalism as a sort of uh, wider assemblage of, of institutions, practices, and Milan spoke about it uh, earlier, so I, I think his, his presentation is, is very good in this respect. So uh, neoliberalism as a discourse of power has a certain rationality of power also. What is termed after Foucault as governmentality and it's different than, than uh, traditional power. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, this uh, uh, neoliberal tar type of discourse of power is, is basically different from traditional uh, types of power and also different from disciplinary power. So we have this new type of discourse of power that, uh, that, that uh, uh, is, uh, is based on different rules than traditional power. If we combine the theoretical languages of Foucault and Lacan, and, and um, one should be very careful in doing this because they differ a lot, so, so uh, you cannot just uh, mix them around uh, without order, we can see uh, if, if we use it uh, strategically, we can see that governmentality moves beyond the traditional discourse of power, the master's discourse. And only in this respect, I will combine the languages of Foucault and Lacan. I will take this notion of governmentality, of neoliberal governmentality from Foucault and uh, to show how, how this, uh, this type of power moves beyond the master's discourse and is very similar to, to other type of discourse, the discourse of the university. So neoliberal governmentality is far from traditional theater of power because it hides the decisions under the guise of expertise. It operates basically by creating incentives towards action. So the rational subject is expected to act according to conditions set by the discourses, practices and institutions of power. So in this type of, uh, of the discourse of power, you don't have this, those arbitrary decisions about what people should do because people are treated as rational agents. So power operates differently, not by setting people to do something, but creating incentives and, and these uh, um, um, conditions for action. 
and the action is the is something that subjects should do by themselves because they are treated as rational economic agents. So neoliberal governmentality doesn't ask what is right or wrong, uh, but what is the, uh, the, the optimal use of resources in, in any given situation, in a, a given situation that, uh, that is created by this neoliberal governmentality because neoliberal govern governmentality operates by creating situations and not by making people do something specific. So examples are, for instance, uh, uh, we can see those examples in the situation of unemployed, uh, when we see how flex security, so this notion of activization and constant evaluation of, of clients, of people who are, uh, who are spoken about as clients in, in, this, uh, in this type of discourse, we have this flex security instead of social security. So instead of this uh, old logic of uh, social rights, of collective bargaining uh, to achieve those collective social rights, we have this flexi uh, flexibility in evaluating individuals who are ranked in, in those uh, ev every sort of positions, you know, and, and they are ranked according to their personal, for instance, ability to work, but also their personal motivation to work. So they are psychologized, individualized, and shown as so um, uh, shown as, as those individuals that can be ranked. And you should also uh, have different contracts with those different clients according to their specific traits. So you have this individualization of, of the situation of unemployed. Uh, and another example, very obvious, and, and uh, a lot of uh, social theory uh, and uh, a lot of sociologists uh, are already speaking about this. So I, I won't be um, uh, I, I won't be um, developing this uh, much. But you have this economization in the spheres of spheres of education, health, science. So the economic rules of evaluation are more and more um, uh, important, are more important, for instance, than the question of aims. What is the, uh, what is the um, rationale of, of this institution? Um, every institution can be evaluated according to economic logic, for instance, of, uh, uh, can be evaluated if it achieved um, its aims as cost effective as it should should be doing. So this cost effectivity, for instance, this productivity uh, of institution in the economic terms is more important than the actual aim of, of uh, functioning of this uh, institution. So uh, we can see that in certain ways, governmentality, uh, neoliberal governmentality is different than traditional power. And maybe it is similar to another discourse, the university discourse. Uh, neoliberal governmentality masks decision, uh, decisions in the guise of expert discourses and political decisions are presented as purely rational responses to constantly changing environment. So they are claimed to be simply descriptions of the state of things along the lines of expert knowledge. So we have this idea that there is no alternative um, uh, towards what neoliberal governmentality um, presents to us as reality to which we have to respond as uh, rational agents. So uh, the decisions of power are, um, uh, are not altered by anyone, but are presented as something purely neutral and, and, uh, and something that appears out of this theoretical discourse. And the subject is no longer a citizen, but economic agent, and uh, his actions are put, uh, are put into constant evaluation. Oh, sorry, I just uh, stop the, the uh, stop the presentation. I'll get back to it. Yes. Uh, so uh, the subject is no longer a citizen. Oh, sorry, I just. You are not sharing with us anymore? Yes, something, something, uh, something strange happened. Is it okay right now? Yes, we can see it. 
uh, yes, but uh, I guess you cannot see the proper slide right now. Mm. Yes, something something strange happened in my presentation. I will I will stop sharing and try to uh, see for another format of my presentation. Sorry, because uh, my program crashed uh, as I see it. Um, sorry for this interruption. I will try to share it once again. Yes, I think it's 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 okay right now. So um, yes, uh, so the subject is no longer a citizen but economic agent, and his actions are put into constant evaluation. Um, for instance, are those actions rational and cost-effective enough? That that is the basic question. So the subject is not uh, uh, not a citizen, but someone who has to act rationally according to the to the um, to, to the um, uh, to the situation that is formed by by this discourses of power and the evaluation of outcomes under neoliberal regime ascribes subjects to different ranks and that is how the university discourse works producing certain subjects so um, ascribing to those subjects uh, different evaluation of the outcomes of their actions and uh, in a way we are all treated by the neoliberal power as those students, those, those little A students that have has to produce some sort of identity for themselves and to uh, be able to aspire to some, some kind of rank that will be, uh, that will be uh, stamped on those subjects. That's, that's how Lacan describes the, the function, the, the actual functioning of the university discourse that it stamps, stamps the subject with a certain rank. Uh, so uh, the effects of governmentality uh, are, uh, I think, very important. I, I don't have much time to, to describe this as I'm already um, some minutes past my, my time, but uh, the basic effects are those uh, as, as uh, written here on this slide, uh, the opacity of power, that is the more, most important, uh, I think, uh, effect. Uh, where the expertise ends and power starts. That is the, one of the basic questions of, of, uh, um, of uh, contemporary uh, discourses of power. Uh, what, is, what is possible uh, in a given condition? Uh, are those uh, possibilities really as narrow as some uh, theoretical discourses show them to us? Uh, so uh, the... Um, and the another, uh, another effect of this opacity of power is the situation of the subject who is acting in constantly changing environment and feels manipulated. And hence the popul popularity of conspiracy theories because uh, if we are governed by impersonal rules, uh, we see our uh, possibilities of action very, uh, very narrow, narrowed down, down to some sort of uh, possibilities only. Uh, but uh, we, uh, in, in a certain way, we can think that somebody is manipulating us from the, uh, from from behind. You know, from uh, there are some people who are constantly manipulating, changing the situation to make it more difficult for us. For instance, that that is the basic structure of every conspiracy theory, and that is the effect of opacity of power because we don't have this notion of who is to blame, who is in charge, uh, because nobody alters those decisions. Those decisions of power are presented to us as something purely rational. And um, the, the last thing is the retur return of traditional power in the form of scapegoat pol politics. So if people want some uh, traditional theater of power, they have it in the form of, of uh, scapegoat politics, for instance. For instance, uh, in, in various versions since 2015, we, uh, 2015, we see it in various forms. For instance, uh, towards uh, the immigrants, towards women, towards uh, a lot of subjects that are put in those 
places of scapegoats that that can be uh, that can be um, put to blame, for instance, and, and uh, presented to people as, as someone to blame. So that would be that would be it. it uh, thank you very much for uh, for listening to me for so long, and I'm very uh, very um, happy to to hear some questions or, or your thoughts about this. Thank you. Thank you, Krzysztof. Um, so I uh, I have to say that uh, I'm really uh, enthusiastic about this discussion because it's really strange how how much, in fact, uh, your two uh, presentations gave um, points of references and and points of um, well that we can we can now link and see uh, where that leads us. Um, I would like to start with some questions. Then I would like to ask Barbara if she also has some questions for you and then to open the floor for the debate further. Um, so since, since, I mean, these two presentations have some uh, similarities really. I mean, one is more focused on Foucault, the other one is more focused on Lacan, but still they communicate on various levels. Uh, this is what I asked you before we started. I would like you to, in fact, tell us um, why these specific authors, and especially with the reference to this last, uh, last point that Krzysztof, you mentioned, with this return of traditional power in the form of scape scapegoat goat politics. I think that one can also uh, think in, in that direction, even, even if he uh, has not up till this moment. This would be, in fact, the way for us to uh, really try to think how we compare our researches in Poland and Serbia, I would, I would guess. Then since uh, this is the second point of, let's say, questioning, since uh, we from the Institute have subsumed this uh, seminars within the Critique Lab, uh, I wanted to ask you about the idea of critique, of course, and that, that came to me through Milan's um, presentation when he mentioned Spoltanski and Chapiello's idea of artistic critique, which is interesting in itself. But then um, I wanted to ask you both, what do you think, what kind of critique do we have at the disposal in the times of governmentality and neoliberalism producing specific subjectivities, especially then uh, from the point of view of culture that Milan put a stress on and um, this kind of new scapegoat politics that Krzysztof put a stress on in the end. What also came to my mind uh, within this um, thought is that this, of course, critique is rela related to subjection, especially in Foucault's understanding of the notion of critique. But as as Milan said, that critique is, um, is, is uh, that in Lacan that mode of subjection is connected to the figure of the big other, and that that is connected to the fulfillment of the lack. Then I was wondering, uh, wh what is uh, in relation to Lacanian theory, which is um, I have to say not very um, clear to me even today. Uh, is what is then left to us, uh, to our disposal? Is it the, then rejecting to fulfill desires? Is it rejecting authenticity, rejecting to be seduced and basically repeating what was given to us by Milan? And if that is what is left to us uh, when we are critical, then maybe we can say that this is a very individualist project where we as individuals are just outsmarting or thinking that we are outsmarting the regimes of governmentality. Uh, to relate this one to Krzysztof's uh, presentation and to Lacan's idea that discourse is a social bond, I, I very much like that idea, but knowing Lacan's fixity in understanding the capacity for change, I wanted to also see with you, with this idea of critique as objection, is it possible for us today to conceive of critique as a kind of an attempt to change the discursive configuration? And is that at any point possible to be a sort of individualistic attempt 
attempt or do we have to have some kind of uh, collective engagement, uh, critique as a collective engagement in that sense? And uh, I will stop with the third question, <laughs> but let, I'm, I'm giving you some, some ideas so that maybe we could, we could um, have some kind of productive discussion now. Um, what Milan <clears throat> mentions in his text, but he did not mention it here uh, during the presentation, and I would like him, in fact, to, to also recreate that part of, of the text. Is the, is the role of homo economicus, which is of course very much present in Krzysztof's uh, presentation as well, even though not mentioned by that name, rather uh, it appears as a rational economic agent. And But um, what I wanted to in fact ask you both uh, is uh, what about classical liberalism? We, we do have a homo economicus there. We do have uh, this idea that know that the individuals are left to their own incentives that they uh, they are not given even the conditions to to follow their own interests uh, we also don't have what is right and what is wrong with the with the, um, this constant circulation of interests that is there with classical liberal, liberalism and so i wonder how how do we include uh, this old notion of homo economicus within this idea of Lacanian beyond the master's function, like the power is now beyond the master's function. Um, I hope this is some kind of food for thought. And then maybe Basha, do you want to, to interfere now or would you like to interfere after these questions, after the answers or? Uh, maybe I will interfere now if I, can I will try to appear also. Uh, um, thank you for your presentations. Maybe my question is much more basic, so maybe now I will um, add it to this discussion. Uh, and I would like to ask both of you, Krzysztof and Milan, um, in general, how do you see the status of your conceptual proposals that combine some concepts of Foucault and Lacan? Because Foucault concepts stem from particular historical studies. Yes, they were invented as an explanatory tool in relation to Western culture and its institutions. And by contrast, psychoanalytic concepts probably claim universe, universality. So um, would you suggest applying your combined concepts for analyzing uh, various cultural orders, uh, also without Christian or liberal traditions, like for example, some Asian cultures with Taoist and Confucian traditions? Or do you assume, assume that your concepts can be intellectual tools mainly for the analysis of Western culture? And if the last answer is correct, um, another question appears. What about Polish or Serbian culture, which belongs, of course, to the Western, in general, to the Western culture, but they are not a core ones? So maybe my question is more basic. <laughs> And I would like to address it to both of you. Very interesting. Uh, I'll, I, I would like to start uh, with the answer to Barbara's question. There is an interesting, um, an interesting story that Freud was, uh, in one of his letters, I think, uh, said that uh, the uh, psychoanalysis can be uh, applied all the way to the border with, between Slovenia and Croatia. Because after, uh, after uh, in Croatia, Bosnia and Serbia, it can be applied because here we uh, we don't have a super ego and we just talk what and do whatever we want. So it's it's funny. When, uh, I mean, it's Orientalist, but it's funny. Um, I would say that uh, I mean uh, Foucault, uh, when he talks about his concepts, he says that they're um, they're like tools. So. If you look at uh, his various works, he, uh, when it comes to his historical research, it's a kind of a dialectical approach between historical material and concept uh, development. And it's a kind of a thing with which he struggles uh, throughout his work because, um, I mean, it's, um, uh, it's really uh, hard because uh, at, at 
one side you want to explain historical phenomena and on the other side you develop theoretical concepts which uh, always have a kind of um, a criteria for not necessarily universality completely but uh, they imply that they can be used in more than one uh, area of research so um, when you develop uh, you have someone like um, uh, she's uh, the book is called read my desire it's joanne uh, maybe Krzysztof can uh, the last name i can't remember it's how you um, john kopczak kopczak yeah uh, there she criticizes foucault from a lacanian perspective uh, his uh, historicism because uh, mm, a psychoanalytic approach necessarily, of course, implies that you are developing concepts that are going to analyze an individual psyche more or less universally. But uh, when it comes to Lacanian theory, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily because what is uh, what is um, powerful in his theoretical perspective is that those concepts are uh, structural, they're formal. So when you have a formal structure, it can be filled with various kind of contents. It's similar with how Althusser understands ideology. So ideology is a relation in the, an individual has to his uh, historical and social position. So when you have a kind of that kind of structure, uh, you can have content which is uh, really diverse. So it's not necessarily, I would say that um, a question whether it can be used in European Asian, uh, African contexts. I don't think I don't think that these structuralist theoretical uh, notions uh, have that kind of let's say a problem because you're not claiming some uh, some universal uh, content of a person's psyche, but just universal uh, structure. So when you say like a structure, when you say like discourse in Foucault, like discourse with its rules and all of that, you can you know every culture has some kind of a discourse. So I don't think that, that, that those problems uh, are something that um, that is really like something that's really problematic for, uh, for, for this theoretical perspective. Maybe Krzysztof wants to add something and then we can move on to Adriana's questions. Well, I, I think you, uh, you really um nailed it in a way, but I, I would say also that there is a, an interesting tension in Lacan's work between the universality of concepts and how do you conceive historicity of those different uh, articulations, so to speak, of discourses, right? So in the case of this particular uh, part of Lacanian theoretical edifice, this theory of discourses, you have this change, this historical change and the, um, and the moment in history when the master's discourse becomes the discourse of the past, because uh, as Lacan states, masters developed something new. They developed capitalism and it, it's, it is something completely different, right? So you don't have this uh, uh, form of traditional power anymore. So you have uh, at the same time, some structural concepts that are uh, are historical, but at the same time you have this tension between historicity and those uh, universal concepts, and that's a uh, and, and that's a difficult one. But also there is a tradition of critique of Foucault of his radical historicism, because if you have only Foucault, you cannot get to the core of what is the discontent of people in culture in any given moment. Because if you have radical historicism, then the subject becomes only something as a product of discourses of power, right? He's constructed uh, by the discourses of power. He can be subversive also, but uh, in psychoanalysis, you have some structural notions, uh, thanks to which you can describe subject and what this subject needs, basically. So the th thesis of my presentation would be that people need to know who is governing them, because if they don't know it, they, they, you know, they produce those kind of crazy uh, theories about what is going on and so on. And, and it has to be like this, you know, you have the structure of university discourse in power and you have the outcome 
and it's something inevitable in a way because people uh, want to know who is in the relationship of governing them right and they don't uh, and then then they don't have this and at the same time they think that someone is pulling the strings in a way so i would say that you have this sort of analysis is possible only when you leave uh, this uh, historicism, this radical historicism, and if you have those some some sort of universalist notions, and just to uh, just to uh, mention the cultural differences, uh, you had some people from different cultures that uh, use those psychoanalytic concepts. Uh, uh, very uh, very well to emancipate uh, uh, emancipate themselves. For instance, Franz Fanon uh, used some notions of psychoanalysis to to uh, to uh, show the possibilities of emancipation. And there is a uh, there is also a big history, of course, of critique of psychoanalytic notions from those uh, points of view. But you can also use those notions. Uh, to show something, uh, something interesting from inside your own culture, as you would have, you know, some Japanese Marxists and and so on and so on. You know, it's possible to use those concepts out of their uh, uh, context. Thank you to you both. Okay, maybe now we can move on to. Adriana's questions. Thank you for 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 these questions. They are they are I think very interesting and very uh, for a fruitful discussion. Now your first question was why Lacan. Well, uh, I remember then when Christoph and I were talking about our presentation, he asked me uh, precisely um, a similar thing, and uh, what I was my answer was that when you read Foucault, when you explore his um, uh, his work, uh, uh, especially when it comes to governmentality and later, which is that third period when Foucault deals with subjectivity, something that I was, uh, that I'm concentrated on for, for the purposes of my dissertation. Um, what you lack there is precisely those um, um, more elaboration of the internal mechanisms of subjectivity. Because when you read Foucault, when he talks about what the subject is, it's uh, a dimension of self-governance and self-reflection, which is what I was saying. But you, you don't get a lot more than that. So what you actually need in order to explain how the subject is being uh, governed, you, you need some something more in order to understand like things like the, uh, the unconscious and, and all of those things, which is uh, Foucault's theory just doesn't... Uh, doesn't have a capacity to incorporate that, which doesn't mean that it's not, it's not, uh, you know, theoretically potent and fruitful and and useful, but it has its own limitations, which of course can be explained. Foucault was, Foucault was a kind of an aversion to psychoanalysis and um, and those things which he he precisely didn't want to uh, to use. You know, when you combine it with uh, with some, some uh, with uh, an author like Lacan, especially through some authors like Zizek and uh, and uh, Mladen Dolar and um, and some other authors, the uh, what what you have is something that uh, that you can use in order to understand more fruitfully how the subject is being uh, governed, and maybe even um, I would say uh, how the, the subject can produce a kind of a resistance, I think a lot um, a lot more uh, in-depth, you have a lot more of an in-depth understanding of, of subjectivity and maybe even possibility for resistance if, if you incorporate uh, Lacan. Uh, and also I think that uh, when it, precisely when it comes to resistance, I think that uh, it, it's something that Foucault was trying to uh, trying to develop uh, in the third period of his work, but I don't think that he uh, that he actually succeeded. I think that um, there are some authors. Uh, I also talked to Krzysztof um, about this that actually say that in the third period of his work, when he was developing the notion of the care for the self and all of that, it is 
eerie similar to a uh, neoliberal and postmodern understanding of, of subjectivity that I was presenting. So what you actually get is this, you know, aesthetics of the self and all of that, which, you know, you, you, you actually have that marketed to you, you know, today. So I think that there is a kind of a, a barrier that, that you reached without the possibility of thinking of resistance. Um, I'll let Christoph talk, maybe, we, and then we can move on to. Well, uh, if you apply uh, Lacanian theory to the problems uh, that we are talking about, discourses of power, you um, you can see uh, that every type of discourse of power uh, eventually must fail uh, because of the construction of subjectivity itself. You know, because every discourse of power has its effects and those effects will eventually lead, lead to failure of this discourse of power. For instance, Milan uh, spoke about this, uh, uh, this, this injunction to enjoy more and more and more. And the problem of today's culture is not that people are desiring too much, for instance. The problem of uh, today's culture is that people have problem with, uh, with opening this dimension of that uh, desire. And that's why the, one of the uh, most uh, widespread symptoms of today's society is depression. And depression is, is this, this uh, space of desire is closed uh, and uh, you feel that your affect is whine, whining. You know, you, you don't have it enough to engage yourself with, with life, with the outer world. So basically that's the problem with those discourses of power that you have those, uh, those strange effects of them on the subjectivity and, and they eventually fail because they, uh, they um, produce those strange effects in subjects. For instance, that subjects uh, are not uh, capable of desiring any, anything anymore, you know, because this injunction to enjoy is, is stiffening them and, and just making them, uh, making them, um, you know, unable to open up this space of, of desires. So uh, basically it shows how, how power must fail eventually. But of course it doesn't have this uh, kind of, uh, of um, collective program because one of those questions by Adriana was, how do we, uh, what do we get out of it? You know, how do we change those programs of power? And uh, it's, it's not a good question for a psychoanalyst to, to answer. Uh, you have to have some politicians to answer those questions. You know, you have to uh, get to, uh, get to um, uh, the point in which you can build some new institutions around some new discourses, right? And the psychoanalyst would not be the one who will produce those discourses, obviously. But the important and interesting question is, how do we get people to actually believe that the change is possible? You know, that it is, that you are um, in a position to propose something new. That is one of the, you know, that, that's one of the basic questions of today uh, in, in, in a lot of different, uh, different spheres, you know, like you have this, uh, um, some, uh, all sorts of crises, you know, like uh, the climate crisis, migration crisis, you have political crisis, uh, constitutional crisis in a lot of countries and so on and so on. And even though those, uh, those crises are everywhere, nothing new seems to be able to emerge. And that is the place in which I think the psychoanalytic uh, theory is, uh, is uh, inevitable, inevitable to understand what is going on, you know, because it's, it's completely irrational in a way that you have those crises uh, everywhere and you are unable to produce uh, some sort of uh, understanding that would put you in a different place. And everybody are talking constantly about that, about change, about programs of change, about you know, creating new world, new society, more, uh, more, you know, with, with more solidarity and so on and so on. And nothing like this actually happens. So it's completely irrational in a way and you know, psychoanalysis is, is, is 
perfect just for that, for explaining why people are doing everything against their own, uh, in a way, interests, against their own will, in a way. And that's, that's why it, it's so useful. Yeah, I would agree. Someone like Mark Fisher talks interestingly about this when he says, when he uh, describes his relationship to his uh, students when he was teaching, and he says that they are actually incapable of engaging with, let's say, reading uh, Friedrich Nietzsche uh, because uh, they don't feel uh, nice. They, it, it, it doesn't feel good. It's not pleasurable to read him, and he he can't ex uh, explain to them that reading Nietzsche is about not feeling good. It's about, it's difficult, but that's the point. And he says that they're incapable of engaging with something like that without this uh, idea that it will make it, engaging with it will uh, make it feel pleasurable. So it's actually interesting that uh, what uh, Krzysztof said about uh, depression it is precisely because uh, depression in Lacan, in Lacan is waning of desire. It's like you, 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 you can't find it. And it's interesting now that uh, precisely when we have this culture that I was describing that is actually uh, producing, you know, artifacts and ways for you to uh, strive towards pleasure and enjoyment. Uh, a Lacanian psychoanalysis would say precisely that that's a problem because you can have desire if you have this, let's say, call it complete freedom. Like uh, uh, desire is about um, you have something that's uh, stopping you, it, you would say the father, quote unquote, you know, like the figure of the father, you have this law that present that to you that something is forbidden and that's why you have desire. And if you don't have that, then you have actually, you don't have desire and you have uh, depression. That's what, that's interesting in, in, um, in postmodern culture, uh, someone like, you know, Zizek and Jody Dean say that you have this disappearance which I was talking about uh, of the big other. So the big other now isn't somewhere out there. Krzysztof, you know, also presented that it's is hidden. And what you have to you presented is this uh, sort of like complete freedom to be yourself and to realize uh, yourself. And that's precisely the uh, the problem because now you when you when we try to imagine change, we can't imagine it because we are actually presented constantly with freedom to change something but not actually the uh, you know the system quote unquote we would say the system and that's precisely the problem because if you don't have the big other if you're completely free then you're actually stuck and i would say answer to adriana's question when it, it comes to criticism uh, to uh, critique and to change uh, it is i would say uh, the struggle today is precisely for us to collectively create a new kind of big other because it is what is actually the big other is what is actually uh, unifying you know the uh, the collectivity it is what unifies us into being a we but if you don't have that if you have this freedom individualism and all of that that's precisely the problem and it is the way that new liberalism actually uh, governs us and doesn't allow us to um, um, to uh, organize because precisely you have the veining of the big other. Um, ju just uh, uh, be before Christoph maybe continues, I would like to invite everyone, since minding the time, we have 20 minutes more uh, assigned for this seminar. So if uh, there is anyone who would like to ask question, please do so by any means that we are uh, given as a chance uh, here with Zoom. Uh, just appear or unmic yourself or... Uh -huh. Andrea Perunovic has a question. So maybe we start with the questions from, from our um, online audience. And Ivan Filimona as well. So Andrea and then Ivan, please. Thank you. Thank you both for, uh, for those for your presentations, um, it was very interesting, and I, I have a question actually on on the on the on the respect for conceptualizations of the subject in in, in Foucault and Lacan. 
And I, I do ask myself if, if it is so, if they are easily superposable, if you wish. Um, my question is mainly, mainly, mainly for Milan, I think. And, and I will start from one, from one um, comparison, one equation that you've made between the ethical substance in Foucault and the desire as lack um, in, in Lacan. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if, I get, if I get well what you want to say, but if the ethical substance is, um, is a substance of the subject in, 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 in Foucault, and we, and we know that he's drawing that, that concept from the, from the ancient Greek concept of aphrodisia, um, we have a subject which which is uh, which is uh, homo homogeneous uh, monolithic, uh, um, which is uh, which can um, which is not uh, which which cannot support the lack. So, so um, how how do you how do you um, how do you equate those those two uh, e those two concepts of of subjectivity? Uh, given at hand on the other side that that the the the, the subject uh, the Lacanian subject is the subject of of the unconscious and that uh, that uh, that this somehow doesn't fit in the in the with the with the Foucauldian one um, and 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 maybe finally um, do those two uh, conceptualizations of the subject if if they are if they are not uh, equal, uh, to, so to say, do they do they stand the the, the same? Uh, do they succumb to the to the same uh, same types of governmentality or the or the regimes of power? That that's maybe a question for me, and, and that would be all for me. Okay, now this is probably a mis uh, kind of a misunderstanding and also um, a. Um, um, <laughs> A consequence of uh, me using certain, uh, you know, theoretical notions to understand um, uh, the the subject in the period of postmodernity. So when uh, Foucault talks about ethical substance, aphrodisia is one kind of ethical substance in ancient Greece. So ethical substances they can be many different kinds. And what I was saying is that um, the way that uh, or in my understanding, in my model of the postmodern subject, uh, his desire is similar to, we can understand it through using L uh, Lacan's understanding of desire. That's what I was trying to say, the way that the individual relates to his own uh, desire, to his own ethical substance is similar to a Lacanian uh, understanding. So that's why, that, that's why maybe, maybe I, I wasn't clear enough. So, um, uh, I, I think that that answered the uh, the question. Maybe uh, when it comes to generally comparing the uh, Foucauldian and the uh, and Lacanian understandings of the subject, of course, there are many uh, tensions there. Precisely what Christoph mentioned when it comes to Foucault's uh, uh, historicism and to Lacan's uh, Lacanian understanding of uh, of the subject, where necessarily since he's a psychoanalyst he's looking for a kind of a universal structure for Foucault um, I'm not sure that he would agree maybe that the subject has a universal structure but these categories that he developed they are kind of serving that purpose they are theoretical tools for understanding so that's where you can see the tension he couldn't conceive of the subject without any universal structure because then you couldn't you know do a, theor uh, a uh, historical um, research using any theoretical notion. Um, Ivan has raised a hand. Please, Ivan. Uh, yeah, thank you. And so first, I wanted to thank both uh, Mr. Svirik and Mr. Urushevich for those presentations. And uh, Lekan is very interesting to me. And thank you for somewhat cre clearing it out. And uh, I have actually two questions, if I may ask. Um, at first, uh, uh, is it like uh, any alternative to a, to a current, uh, 
I might say, master's discourse, uh, like, and uh, should it be the new master's discourse, or uh, we, or, or there is a possibility to create a whole another, a whole another th system uh, without uh, the big other, and uh, after. Uh, after that, uh, Mr. Shvirik said that uh, uh, actually individual uh, is stuck without Big Other, and I wanted to ask, is it really so? And maybe there is a possibility to live and act without. Uh, and uh, the other question is kind of like flowing out of the first one. Uh, is it possible for a subject to become an individual in a sense that, indiv uh, that uh, for individual, uh, the concept of big other will lay in, in like in himself, like the individual will, will become big other for, for himself or is it logically impossible? Krzysztof, you can go first now. I was answering the the other question first, so. Uh, well, thank you. Um, thank you for those questions. Uh, with uh, the first one, uh, I, I think that those uh, theories of subjectivity are incompatible in, in, in fact, and, and uh, that would be, uh, for, for me, uh, that would be a start, starting point, which doesn't uh, mean that you cannot use any uh, notion of Foucault uh, and, and try to combine it with uh, Lacanian uh, notions because uh, Foucault is, is, is a really uh, great uh, reconstructor of uh, modern discourses of power. And uh, I, I, I think that his, uh, his um, works are, are really powerful descriptions of how, uh, how power works nowadays. Uh, as to the other questions, is there an alternative to, to a master's discourse? Uh, well, probably uh, there are some uh, alternatives, of course, and one of those alternatives is a, a discourse of analysis, right? Because uh, if you go to analysis, you uh, learn precisely this, how to live without a master, right? But it's a very uh, difficult task uh, and you have to go to analysis and probably go there for, for years to be able to, to uh, conceive a, a, a new structure, right? Restructure, restructured um, subjectivity. We have to understand that, that uh, this uh, Lacanian theory was based on the practice of psychoanalysis, right? So the subject for Lacan is a subject of language, basically. The, uh, the subject of speech. So uh, if you have big other, uh, you have to be able to relate to some big other, to be able to communicate with, uh, with, uh, with other subjects, right? So you don't have, uh, you don't to live under a king to have a big other, right? Because big other is virtual and it, it, it's, a, it's a virtual entity that is based on the a sheer fact of exchanging signifiers between people. So you have to have this uh, recourse to some shared uh, rules of uh, how to word, uh, words relate to each other and how do we re relate to each other and to the, to the world and so on and so on. And the problem with Big Other nowadays is that the market is supplying you with all those small objects that provide you uh, with enjoyment, right? So you don't need Big Other anymore. You don't need uh, uh, to renounce anything because you are enjoying this much. So basically you have to have this sort of recourse to Big Other to be able to maintain luck and to be able to man maintain desire. And it doesn't, you know, it, it, do, it doesn't matter if the big other is the traditional king or the pope, or is it a, some sort of different kind of, uh, you know, uh, stand in for big other, because all those figures of power are basically stand ins for big, big other. So you don't have to have this uh, kind, partic this particular historical kind of a master to be able to maintain luck, basically. 
because big other is something different from a master. And it's definitely something other than a historical forms or historical figures of a master. But you have to uh, be able, uh, for instance, to structure the relationship of power properly. So you have to, uh, you have to know who is actually governing you, right? So this uh, constant play of, you know, uh, ter turning the question, like for instance, people ask, why do you do this? Uh, for instance, the, the, those who are in power, those who are who are uh, deciding those uh, different things. Why do you do this? And people in power say, we didn't decide this. You know, the situation caused this to to do it. That's the basic, you know, uh, problem with today's power that it's not playing the game right. It's not taking the uh, the um, uh, you know the responsibility for, for the actions, right? And this is a basic problem of power. If the power is not um, responsible for, for its actions, then who is actually? So, um, you know, it doesn't mean that, that we have to live in a monarchy, you know, or under a authoritarian government, but you have to structure those relations right. That would be my answer. Let me please uh, ask Marian Irkovic to to jump in with a question, and then maybe um, and then maybe we kind of um, cap it up. Marian, sorry. And uh, thank you, Dan Krzysztof, for wonderful presentations. Really, really stimulating and interesting. Um, and it seems to me one other. Um, common thread that runs through both of your presentations is that uh, you both conceive of the neoliberal uh, governmentality and neoliberal uh, social order as a certain uh, configuration that interweaves two distinct uh, logics of discourse, let's call them that way. Uh, one is the logic that we might term ethics of authenticity. Uh, which Milan has focused on a lot and which involves this kind of ethical work on, on looking for authentic desires and which kind of interpolates and subjects individuals by constructing them as these authentic subjects that need to realize themselves. And then the other logic um, that Krzysztof focused on uh, more is the logic of expertise, the logic of justifying uh, decisions by recourse to, to uh, technocratic expertise. Now, it seems to me there is a certain degree of tension between these two logics. Uh, and I think this tension is good, can be defined well by means of these two questions that Krzysztof relies on in his uh, presentation. And the first question is related to the master discourse, that is, who is speaking, whereas uh, the second question is the one characteristic of the university discourse, what is to be done? Now, uh, when it comes to ethics of authenticity, the question of who, the question of who is speaking of identity seems to be quite important. Uh, um, whereas on the other hand, the way that subjects are being uh, classified, um, uh, governed uh, in, in neoliberal regime, is the one of, of technocracy and which is exemplified by this example of flex security that Krzysztof mentions, where this instrumental rationality of, of evaluating constantly and, and measuring individual, activizing them without any telos, without any questions of aims, is, the, is that the logic of expertise. On the other hand, these same subjects which are being governed through flex security are supposed to be subjects of authentic self-realization. Uh, so do you both see any kind of tension within the neoliberal regime, uh, which, uh, which basically um, consists of these two different logics of, of, of discourse? And can, can social critique perhaps uh, exploit this tension for the purpose of criticizing neoliberalism? Thanks. Yeah, I would say this is a really, really interesting uh, observation, Marian. I would say that one of the reasons why uh, why 
uh, I was talking about one kind of logic why, uh, while Christoph was uh, focusing on the other is maybe because in my presentation I was more focusing on culture, which is kind of an area which I was, I'm dealing with a lot, while Christoph was, I would say, more in the area of uh, political governance and economics. So maybe I think that they, those are kind of two discourses that are also characteristics of two spheres in a society, two subsystems, so to call them, which then, um, which are uh, governed by these two, these two kinds of uh, kinds of um, discourses, th these two kinds of logics. I would say that, uh, you know, you got me there when it comes to the question of how uh, could we exploit the tension. I think that um, if you look at this kind of, uh, I would say, there. There is this what you call uh, the accelerationist idea, this uh, delusion idea, when uh, uh, which is a kind of anti-Lacanian, where he says that uh, the when he says that uh, capitalism deconstructs and we say deterioralizes the subject constantly, making it sh uh, schizophrenic, but uh, not completely because the subject all uh, for capitalism the sub. Uh, it is necessary uh, for it to be for there to be a unified self for those who are uh, governed and his idea uh, is that um, what we need to do actually is deterritorialize the subject even more that's why the schizophrenic uh, subject is anti-capitalist uh, for him so one of the way uh, it could be that um, if we have within uh, culture this ethics of authenticity, maybe uh, a kind of a kind of a new ethics of kind of uh, a different subjectivity, which is completely uh, completely like deconstructed, could be a way out. Although I wouldn't subscribe to that because that would be um, it's not something that I would uh, that I would see as a way of political um, resistance, but. Uh, I think that there is a kind of, a, let's call it a hypocrisy of power in neoliberalism, where on the one hand, you have this logic of discourse that focuses on freedom, but on the other way, you have these, you know, laws of the market, the laws of this, when it says, you know, this, the market says this, and we have to do that. So this technocratic idea, which is completely not a complete antithesis of freedom, because you're governed with these, um, not uh, non-personal uh, laws that are like presented like natural laws. So I would say that that tension definitely exists there. I would uh, like to add briefly because we we are uh, out of time um, almost uh, that um, you have also experts that uh, would di dictate to, uh, to you how to be authentic, right? You have experts of authenticity in, in modern culture, in, in contemporary culture, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's a specific authenticity also. So we have different regimes of authenticity in the modern world and uh, basically uh, uh, authenticity uh, that is offered to us on neoliberal uh, in, in those uh, uh, institutional designs of neoliberalism is very marketized and marketable also, and very uh, subjected to uh, expert discourses. You know how to be, um, you know how to be active, how to be enjoying yourself in life, how to be able to um, put some aims to your action. You know you have experts that that will tell you how to do this. So basically for me, there is some tension, but it's also easy to overcome you have if, if you meet the right expert to be authentic. But also those two dimensions of authenticity and the logic of expertise are something completely different from the law. And this dimension of law is absent from them. And this dimension of, of, of the law is uh, precisely what is introduced by the big other right because big other is uh, other name for functioning of the law so if you have to be authentic uh, it's it's other than the logic of right and wrong or, or be rightful and 
uh, unlawful, you know, someone outside the law. So uh, the dimension of law is something completely different from those two dimensions. And this is what is, you know, precisely absent from this culture. And uh, the question from, from Mr. Ivan on the chat, uh, should market be considered as the virtual big other? I think that precisely uh, because it's not the dimension, the dimension of the law is absent from the market. The dimension of the law as something subjective, you know, something that uh, injuncts you to do this or that, you know, to be able to become a tragic subject, you know, that has some sort of internal conflicts within himself or herself. That's why the market cannot become big other. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank. Thank you all for the the wonderful discussion, and and especially to you, Krzysztof and Milan. Uh, this was really a very uh, interesting and very challenging, I would say, seminar because we really managed in the end reach us some kind of well, some kind of bridging of uh, various ideas that they were already there in your presentations. Um, uh, so I just want to uh, remind you all that we will now have a little break of, uh, we will not meet in May, but then in June we will have our own Barbara Bosak Herbst and uh, Sara Nikolic on the 7th of June, uh, with which we will then um, uh, end our meetings in the spring semester, but there is already some kind of uh, announcement of continuation for, for the autumn one. Thank you very much again and see you in June again. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.